experts meet to discuss everything from home, family, finances, garden, and garage. We have it covered. And we have some exciting guests today, so make sure you get a pencil and a paper, because we're going to be talking about taxes and how you can save money on your taxes, maybe some tax tips that you didn't know about. So in the studios with me today is my co-host, Carolyn Wolf with Certified Mortgage Planners. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Jean. Pleasure to be here. Yes, and before we bring in our guest uh, from uh, GI Tax, I want to talk a little bit about taxes as far as the mortgages and so forth, because you, oh, before we go any farther, you have to give out your number. You got that right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My <laughs> license number is 268-538, and I'm with Certified Mortgage Planners. And Carolyn's number is 321-795-9103, and she's right here in the Indian Atlantic area. Mm-hmm. I started to think Indian Harbor Beach. No, it's Indian Atlantic. <laughs> right here locally on the Space Coast. So we're going to talk about taxes and so forth, but I want to talk a little bit about mortgages because now we're into February. It's it's uh, season, people, and the northern buyers are here. They're wanting to uh, see homes. They're not staying on the market very long. And Some of the things that they may not have thought of because they get here and all of a sudden they want a home and they need a mortgage and you need special paperwork from them. Right. So what are some of the things that if someone's listening from the north or someone is here that can get their hands on some of this paperwork um, from their home base, what are some of the things that you're going to be required to have before you can uh, pre-qualify them. Okay. Thank you, Jean. That's actually a great point. Even when, uh, especially the people that are in the process of moving and packing, we always do remind them to make sure to keep out their important documents. And I'm very glad to have uh, Glenn here from GI Tax because one of the most important things we need is tax returns for two years, typically. And nine times out of 10, we have those stored away because, of course, it's, you know, almost two years away, Mm -hmm. or has been, Um, we need pay stubs, bank statements, photo ID. But the main thing is making sure that you have those things readily available and not packed away in a secure all the way in the far box where you can't get to it. Okay, in a pinch, we can't get those taxes for some reason. Can we call, go down to to the uh, IRS office? Can we call IRS and have them send them to us? I know it's probably going to be a lengthy time, but can we do that as well? Consumers can request a copy of their transcripts from the IRS. Mm-hmm. How long do you think that takes in general? Have you gotten any idea? If not, we'll ask Glenn. Maybe he knows. I'm sure he, he comes would on. know. A uh, couple more things. Uh, some of the things we always say before you go out looking at homes, before you meet with your real estate agent, um, give Carolyn a call. Find out for sure exactly what you qualify for because you may think you can only qualify for X amount, mm-hmm. but you have different points and so forth. And one of the things we always say is you want to season your money. I love that mm-hmm. because there's certain things that take time to, you know, for an example, two years of tax returns, and you also need certain things that are on a timely basis. So when you're applying for a a loan, don't you have to go back, what is it, two months for pay stubs and so forth? It's actually one full month for pay stubs, but two months for the assets, so bank statements. Bank statements and so forth. two full months. Right. So that's one of the things that you may not know about. Also, if you're going to be putting a, a fairly good amount down, and a lot of times people sell something. Maybe they sold a boat six months ago, and they thought, oh, I'm just not going to put it in the bank. I'll just hold on to it. That's not always a good idea when you're using it for your down payment because you're going to want to see where those assets are. Correct. We do need to have a fun season, so cash can be a little tricky. Mm-hmm. So sure. uh, those are the kinds. Of, what what do they normally like to see? At least two months in a an account or a trackable Correct. right. Record? Two months in a bank statement or in a bank account. So I always tell people too because you have to take into consideration that your bank statement might have just come out and now you have to wait another full thirty days for another bank statement. Mm-hmm. So typically it's going to be a little bit longer than sixty days worth of bank right. statements. And those are those things that slow you down. So imagine you've gone out, you've looked for your dream house, you you know you've got $20,000 sitting at home. So you're thinking, bing, bang, boom, I'll just go and get that mortgage. And so all of a sudden, 
everything breaks. We're putting on the brakes because we can't get you qualified because you're sitting there with cash, which seems ridiculous that we can't use cash anymore. But right. that's how they are tracking uh, the good guys and the bad guys, right? They right. want to see where people are getting that money. Right. I can remember Act. back in the day, many years ago, um, I guess it was they were trying to track uh, the, uh, the drug business or something. But anyway, if we took cash in our office, a real estate office, we had to make copies of it. So we had all the serial numbers right. and put that in the file. But anyway, those are <laughs> the things we have to live with at this point. So without further ado, get those pencils and paper handy because... We're just about ready to introduce our wonderful guest, Glenn Sadler with GI Tax. Welcome to the show. Thank you. We're really happy to have you here, and I know it's tax season, and you're busy, busy, busy. But tell us a little bit about GI Tax, uh, how you made you founded it, didn't you? Uh, you're the president of GI Tax. Yes, I am. It was founded um, in 2012. Uh, we exist because we want to start selling tax franchises to, get to guys and girls that have served in the military. So when they get back, they can own their own businesses. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. Yep. We um, we have been growing. The first year, we did about 300 returns. The second year, about uh, 600. Then we did 800. And last year, we did 1,500 returns. That's crazy. We're starting to get franchised around the whole country. If you come and visit us, we bleed red, white, and blue. We have American <laughs> flags. We have um, every. If you walk in, you, you can't help than getting hit in the face with America when you walk in. You know what I liked about your office, besides the professional things that you have there, you've got all, you got a, uh, what do you call it, a a game, um, what what is that? Yep, we have a a video game system that has a hundred, that has a hundred games in it, so when parents come in with their children, they can sit there and they can play. They can play. We have sunglasses for kids, we have candy, we have bottled water. It's one probably the only tax office in the world where kids don't want to leave. You know, they do the whole <laughs> they do the whole wet potato thing when they lay down on the floor because they don't want to leave. They yeah. just they beg their parents to come back. So we create an environment that's really family friendly. And you have the one how many locations so far here in Brevard County? Just one right now. We're working on opening another one in Palm Bay. We're starting to get franchised in thirty three states and probably starting April or May we're gonna start selling franchises around the country. And you're right uh, almost across the street from eastern Florida. State College. I still want to call it BCC. How long have they changed their name? Two years ago or three years ago? And I'm still saying BCC. You're right there on Wickham Road near Post. In between between Post Post and Parkway, Parkway. almost just catty corner from the school. Right. There's a Starbucks in our parking lot. There's a Um, pizza place, too. There's a Marco's Pizza (laughs) is right next to us also. We have a subway in there. You come Uh, in, you'll uh, love to get your taxes done. You can eat it at the same time. Exactly. How how better can that be? So tell us a little bit uh, more about that franchise because I think that's so important. We have our military and we thank them for their service. They get here and maybe they want to start a business, but... For whatever reason, uh, there's, they don't know what to do, and this is obviously a, a, a lucrative business to start, and they could give you a call they, and they find can, out a little bit more. Is there an online website that explains it a little bit more in detail? We uh, have a website. Uh, it's gitax.com. Um, it's, um, it's, it, it, would be, it would be a great franchise for anybody. You do not have to be a veteran to own one as long as you understand that when you are a GI tax franchise owner, you are going to support the military. We give ten dollars from every tax return to a military charity. Last year was almost fifteen thousand wow. dollars. Wow! Our goal, and it sounds it sounds kind of crazy, but our goal is to have about a thousand locations around the country. If we do that, we can give in a neighborhood of ten or twenty million dollars to military charities. Wonderful! Yeah. And you say a thousand franchises? Oh man, that's a lot. Well, there's more H and R Block franchises than there is Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Really? So, yes, there is a lot of tax franchises, and we just want to get our market share. There's 495 military bases. There's no reason why we can't have two around every military base, and that's how we get our 1,000 franchise project, uh, projections. Well, that is wonderful, and we I, I put some questions together and so forth, and I know that we need to go over what people – right now people are gathering up all their receipts and getting ready. To, some will come in on April – what is it? 15th is the deadline. Is I think it's April 16th? 18th. It might be 16th this 16th. year. It's whatever that mo- it's whatever that Tuesday is okay. because Monday is actually a holiday. Okay, that's So right. if April 15th falls on a, on a weekend – or on a Monday, it's due that Tuesday, and I believe mm-hmm. it's April 16th this year. Well, they're all trying to gather. Most people come in like a 24 hours ahead of time and want to get their taxes done. 
And again, just like April Carolyn, 18th. what is it, April? April 18th. 18th. We looked at yep. the calendar. Just like Carolyn said with mortgages, the same thing applies when you're getting your taxes done. There's things that you need to be doing now so you're not sitting there across from one of your uh, wonderful uh, agents that are helping out, or consultants, I guess is the, the correct word, and all of a sudden you're dumping, you know, a shoebox full of receipts on them. What would be some of the tips you could tell people right now at home to uh, to get prepared before they go in to, uh, uh, to have their taxes done? The best advice I can give my clients is I want everything. The tax law is very simple. It says, first of all, the first line of tax law says everything's taxable. Then there's 79,000 pages of exceptions. The only way I know what... <laughs> Wait a minute, 79,000... Pages of exceptions? Yes. That's what the tax law is. It's 79,000 pages. And they wonder why we can't do taxes by yes. ourselves. And why it takes professionals. We need Glenn. Yes. So what I what I tell every one of my clients is I want everything because the tax law says if something has a business purpose, it's deductible. Well, business purpose is different from one person to another. So I need to be the one to make that determination if it's a business-related expense or not. A lot of people, when they file their own taxes, they think they're very conservative. They don't think that they should take the take these deductions because they're worried about what the IRS is going to say. The Internal Revenue Service wants you to take these deductions. They even say, in, when I was taking my master's course, I was taking IRS you know, fraud, uh, fraud classes. Uh, they say that if you um, have a 20% chance of winning an argument, take the deduction. That means if you have an 80% chance of losing, they still want you to take it. Unless you flat out lying, they want you to try to take it because if you're entitled to it, you should take the deduction. Mm -hmm. And in people's tax brackets right now and how tough the economy is, $300 in somebody's pocket is a lot better in their pocket than it is in somebody else's pocket. So Mm -hmm. we will do everything we can to make sure we get every single dollar for our clients. You've been listening to Glenn Sandler, Sandler, just like Adam Sandler. Just like Adam. (laughs) Is that any relation? Um, Unfortunately not. (laughs) (laughs) Glenn Sandler with uh, GI Tax right here in the Melbourne area across from the Eastern Florida State College on Wickham Road between Parkway and Post. A couple of things that um, we thought would be pretty interesting to talk about, especially since we have Carolyn Wolf here with Certified Mortgage Planners. People that own their own home, what can they legitimately take as far as a tax break on owning that home if they're paying a mortgage? They can take their interest deduction. They can take their property tax deduction. They might be entitled to a uh, energy, uh, an en- a residential energy credit. And if they qualify, there are limitations, but they will be able to deduct a portion or all of their uh, PMI insurance, their payment mortgage insurance. Okay. So how about a homeowners association? That's, uh, is that deductible or no? Unfortunately not, and they're pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. They don't, they, again, the tax law says that if, something, if, if something's tax or interest-related, you can deduct it, but if it's personal, you're not allowed to. We just talked about homeowners. Well, the year when they close on their house, there are certain other deductions they can take also. On their HUD statement, there's a lot of fees that might be deductible, mm-hmm. such as loan origination fees, such as transfer taxes, such as interest that might be paid and listed on a closing statement, but then out on the 1098 when they get it from the bank. So you want to go through your your closing statement and make sure you capture every single expense that you paid at closing that will be deductible in that year. There are a lot of things that are deductible that people don't realize that they are. Well, those are the kind of things that we're always trying to share with, um, especially with my clients as uh, Gene Newell working with real estate uh, in the in, in the area for many years. And I always try to set, I always tell people, listen, I, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a tax advisor, I'm not a mortgage planner, I'm not a doctor, and I never played one on TV. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm a great realtor, right? I do, well, I do know enough to know that. Certain things are relevant enough to go to the expert to find out for sure, because I certainly don't want to tell someone that, oh, you know, if you're paying $1,000 a month, technically, technically, if you're in a 28% tax bracket, you're only paying, you know, I don't want to get into that. But there are some very strong reasons why your, your interest versus a rental payment is completely different. Um, you really get a bigger break off of the same amount that you're paying for a mortgage payment than if you were getting a rental. Rent expense is not a deductible expense, but it, but interest is. Mm-hmm. And we uh, we have free consultations. If for some reason you want to ask a question, you can call us. You can stop by. We don't charge for it. We'll go over your HUD statement with we with you. We'll give any kind of advice you want to. 
we help thousands of people out all year long. We're there, you know, 12 months a year. You see, we have on the sign right now, we're open 24-7 appointments. So if you work in the hospital and you want to have an appointment at 4 o'clock in the morning when you get off work, we'll meet you at the shop if you want us to. We'll, we're there for our clients. But we want to make, wow. sure, we want to make sure that our clients re- receive every single tax benefit they can when they prepare their tax returns. If we do not provide that service, then we're not doing our job. We have what's called the Patriot Bar, similar to the Genius Bar at Apple. If you're one of our tax clients, you can use us for financial advice all year. Mm-hmm. I That's like great. That. Go ahead and give out your phone number and sure. make sure that people can jot this down. So we have 321-259-4482, which is 259-GI-TAX. We, um, we, our it. website is www.gitax.com. And you also you have an 800 anytime. number. We have an 800 number. I'm trying to remember what there it is. There it is. <laughs> I think it's 1-800-877-4482. It's Which the is, same 4482. It's GI tax at the end. So. You know, that always fascinates, fascinates me, how you can manage to get a phone number that spells out exactly what you want it to spell yeah. out. Because that's tough to get. You have Did to you go have look to, for it. You have to I work know. for it. You, yeah, some yeah. of them will hold hostage that number, too. And boy, you have to pay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's that's wonderful. So, Glenn, let's also talk about some of the things, especially the people that own their own business, which would also be your independent contractors. So real estate agents, appraisers, a lot of people that are not necessarily employed Um, with a company, but they have to have a 1099 and they have to, you know, have to actually do their own taxes throughout the year. And they have a, maybe a little bit more write-offs than the the average person that's employed. Would you agree to that? Yes. As a matter of fact, since the meltdown in 2008, a lot of people have become self-employed as opposed to being employees of companies because people don't want to employ, employ, employ people because of the the um, basically the healthcare laws. Mm-hmm. So what happens? A lot of people are working as independent contractors. You talk about realtors. You talk about there's there's lock there's there's lawyers. There's people that clean houses. Right. There's people that mow lawns. Anybody that does work for themselves is considered self-employed. When you're self-employed, uh, it's different than being a, uh, a salary employee or employee employee of a business where you start with the amount that you get paid. You'll receive a 1099 for that income. But then you can write off every single expense that's business related. And when you're self employed, you'd be surprised how many of your expenses are truly business related. Is your phone business related? Is your internet business related? How many miles are you driving? When you're an employee of a company, your commuting is not deductible. But when you're self employed, all your mileage is deductible. Mileage is 59 and a half cents a mile right now in a deduction. I like wow. that. So if you're if you've got your home office, isn't there a rule of thumb that if you you're paying a cell phone bill that you can only deduct 75 or 90 percent of that because they're going to think you're going to be using that as personal as well? What is is there a magic formula on that? Well, there used to be it used okay. to be when cell phones remember it was 25 cents a minute and you paid by the minute and the IRS would actually want you to separate your business phone calls from your from your oh. personal phone calls. It was a nightmare. Well, now with, when you pay a hundred dollars a month. All your phone calls are included, so you can't do that. So there's two rules of thumb. One is the IRS says if you have one that you use exclusively for business, you can deduct the whole bill. So a lot of people go and get that $35 a month thing from Walmart, whatever it's called, I can't remember, and their Mm -hmm. cell phone they treat as a business expense. Mm -hmm. Or I've actually had the pleasure of working with the IRS, and I received (laughs) a letter from an employer that says that they're required to carry their phone um, for work, Mm -hmm. and therefore it becomes deductible. So. Again, it goes to your 79,000 pages of exceptions, and it says if something has a business purpose, it is deductible. So, again, business purpose could be different from one person to another, but if you can document that you use your phone for business, then it's deductible. So, the other thing a lot of people forget is if you're, let's just say a real estate agent, it costs us over $1,000 a year, really, in, in uh, fees and, and joining the Board of Real Estate, and Board of Realtors, as well as the National, and all of those fees are also deductible. A lot of people forget about their union dues or other things or maybe books that they have to buy or, or um, go to seminars and different things like that. So not only is there travel expense, but also the uh, information they might have to buy to, to extend their uh, education in that particular business. If you have realtor magazines delivered to your house, those subscriptions are actually deductible. Mm-hmm. When you go out of town on a business trip, your meals are deductible. 
you know, transportation, if you have to do some dry cleaning when you're out of town, those are deductible. Again, if you, if you can document that it is a business-related expense, then it becomes deductible. Those union dues are a big one. You know what else? So safe deposit boxes are deductible. And wow. your prior tax return fee was deduct is deductible. If you before. if you go to a, a lawyer, if you go to anybody for financial advice, you can deduct those fees as an investment expense. There, nice. there's a lot of things that you can deduct, and that's why you want to make sure that you capitalize on everything you possibly can. Because even if you're in a twenty percent or a twenty five percent tax bracket, that's two hundred fifty dollars for every thousand you can deduct. So think about your mileage at six thousand. You know, six thousand miles. Let's that you're talking about a, almost a three thousand dollar deduction, a twenty percent tax bracket. You're talking about a six hundred dollar refund. It's a difference in your refund is six hundred dollars. And I work like with my clients, like every single one of them, my family. I want to get every single dollar I possibly can for my clients. Right. So, out of those seventy nine thousand pages of exceptions, <laughs> how many of those do you think change every year? Um, they keep adding to them. I get a feeling they're going to try to start trimming them down, depending mm-hmm. on what's going on in the news. Right. But I, I don't think that's going to happen either, because if they start trimming them down, it's only going to cost the people that mm-hmm. are on the bottom of the scale. You can't take a home interest deduction away from somebody if they own a house. You just you just can't do it. So I think that they're probably going to slow down. But there there are some that are very beneficial, especially to self employed people. When you're self employed. As, as well as 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 well as I am, everything you pretty much do twenty four hours a day is business related. If you can document everything you do as being business related, you can write off a lot. Now let's talk about where we came in here for with the mortgages. You have to be really careful if you're self employed and you want to buy a house. Yeah. If you don't show enough income, you're not going to qualify. So there's a fine line between what kind of a self employed tax return you want to do when you're working with a mortgage broker. Right. That's why uh, we we talked about it before that there should be a good close relationship between the buyer, the mortgage broker and the accountant because mm-hmm. they want to be able to put together a proper tax return so you can qualify so you can buy that house that you love. Exactly. We've Absolutely. talked about all, that on former shows as well right. that you have to be very careful because on paper you might not pay be paying very little or no taxes but then when it comes time to qualify you don't show any income. So it's a it's a catch 22 there. You got to be careful right. what you're doing. Well, um and the nice thing too like with Glenn sometimes people might have that knee jerk reaction where like, Oh my goodness, I have to, you know, pay, show everything where Glenn and I can have a conversation and work with that specific client so that we can at least get them as much deductions as they possibly can and still get the home. Exactly. Just to make sure that people understand this, because some people might be fairly new at um, a business and so forth. If you're taking back to the car, if you're taking 59 cents, you can't then also take uh, gas or repairs on your car. It's one or the other. It's one or the other, yes. Do you find that the 59 cents actually is better in in most cases, or I guess it's one-on-one, of course? Usually, I'd say 90% of the time it's better Mm -hmm. because it's based on business use of your car. So. If you don't, if say the your mileage is only half the amount of miles you drive through the year, then you only get half the depreciation. You don't get to deduct all the repairs. You only get to deduct half. But record keeping wise, it's a lot easier. You just take track your mileage, write it down in a log every day. At the end of the year, you calculate how many miles you have, and you multiply, and you get your business deduction. Now, what things can you still take that do not require a receipt? I remember years ago, and uh, it used to be some magic formula. Like if you went out for a, a lunch. And it came to under it came to twenty five dollars. You could or or more. You can take twenty five dollars and put it in your uh, your calendar as a deduction, even if you didn't have the receipt. As long as you uh, put it into a, a diary or into a calendar, is that still apply? Or it still that... applies. I don't. I think that's more practice than it is theory. I, I'd have to check the seventy nine thousand pages. Yes, I think but... that's on page <laughs> yeah. three thousand one hundred forty eight. <laughs> <laughs> but the rule of thumb is if you have a, a business expense and you and you you um you document it, you disclose it, you say who you went to lunch with, what you discussed, how much the lunch was, you can show on your bank statement that you ran through your debit card right now, that mm-hmm. would qualify as as a receipt mm-hmm. and then it becomes deductible. And if you paid by cash, you better have that receipt. It's you're just safer with it. I'm uh-huh. not saying that you can't get away. If the IRS is worried about a twenty five dollar deduction for a lunch at Bur- right. at Burger King, they right have bigger problems with you. Exactly. So the best way is to always keep the receipts. But if you don't, it doesn't mean don't deduct it. It means if you're entitled to it, try it. If for some reason they came and audit you, 
um, then you could always bring the receipt up. Then you can bring some way you can show some proof. But if you're entitled to the deduction, then you should take the deduction. Exactly. Well, the one thing also that I think is very important is if you had if you had a your druthers, as they say, wouldn't would you like to have people that have already gone through their receipts and maybe put them in a uh, uh, paper clip them together as far as these are receipts for utilities, these are receipts for this. So when they come into you, maybe you even have that's what I do. I, I clip it all together, then I put a little sticky note on the front with the totals. And so when I give it to my tax advisor, everything is right there. So you know, you can do the do the taxes right from all the piles without going through everything and, and so forth. Then she can tell me, you know, whether something's deductible or not. It definitely helps, but there's always times where you might forget something. So, that, again, that's always a start. I sit down with my clients and I discuss everything with them. I had a self-employed person the other day. I had a self-employed person the other day that forgot to tell me that she bought a van for work. Okay, so there. So that's why you want to sit down and have a right, conversation. Ask the questions. Well, that's what we always say when you're going for a mortgage. Don't assume that there's only one or two types of mortgages that you can qualify for. Exactly. You've got to find. You've got to do a little homework and and give yourself a little time to put all these things into motion. Let's talk uh, quickly. We've only got a couple more minutes. A little bit on capital gains since we're talking about real estate and exactly what that means to people when they're buying and selling a new home. Buying and selling a personal residence isn't capital gains. Well, it's, it, it would be capital gains if you had to pay tax on it. But there are exclusions for gain on the sale of a personal residence. A capital gain is when you buy and sell an investment. Mm-hmm. If you buy and sell an investment, your, your capital gains are taxed at 20%. But you have to understand if you lose money on investment, your capital your capital loss that you can deduct any year is only three thousand dollars a year. So if you lose a hundred thousand dollars on something, it'll take you thirty years to be able to deduct it. But there wow. are there are rules for rental properties though. So you might if you buy a house, and again it's based in intent. If you call it a rental property as opposed to an investment property, then there's different tax laws. So there's a lot of different things that you have to talk about before you just talk about this. But capital gains are basically taxed at twenty percent. I know uh, it's always good, too, if somebody started a business to ask your your advice on whether they should be sole proprietor, set it up as an S-corp, S-corporation and do different things, because that makes a difference on what they pay on taxes, especially that first year. Yes, it does. There's I could, I could actually talk on another half-hour radio show yeah. about business entities. It's <laughs> funny because I teach it to college, and I was talking about business entities to my class last night. What happens is if you don't re, if you don't file as a business entity in Florida, you're basically a sole proprietor. If you're a sole proprietor, you don't have any limited liability protection. So if something, God forbid, happens, they can sue you personally. What you want to do is you want to file as a limited liability company, an LLC, or a corporation in the state of Florida. Now, you talk about an S-Corp. An S-Corp, the difference between it, – it's hard to talk about this, but if an LLC is originally taxed as a partnership, and a corporation is, is taxed as a corporation – what that means, if you're a partnership, all your income is subject to Social Security tax. If you're an S-Corp, uh, can you make an election in either one of those or entities to become an S-Corp, only what you pay yourself in salary is subject to Social Security tax. Social Security tax is 15.3%. So the, the wise thing is to form one of those entities, make yourself an, an S-election, pay yourself a salary, and then all the income that you earn above that salary is not subject to that 15.3%. So that's some great tips. So if you're thinking about going into business, would you talk with them before they go into business to kind of help them set up the, the corporation? I would, or the love, I would love to. I do it. Glenn, give out yes. your phone number and how they can get in touch with you again with GI Tax, Glenn Sadler. It's 321-259-4482 is our phone number, www.gitax.com is our website. Our 800 number is 1-800. Um, <laughs> it's um, 800. Seven. Uh, 1-800-800-8800. 877 <laughs> gi tax 4482 Sorry about that. Yes, all right. Carolyn Wolf, oh, we appreciate you coming on again today with us. Carolyn Wolf with, Carolyn Wolf with Certified Mortgage Planners. Give out your phone number and contact information, please. Okay, Gina, it's a pleasure being here with you. My phone number is 321-795-9103, and that is the best way to reach me. And if you would like some more information about Your Hometown Solutions, please check us out at our website, yourhometownsolutions.com, where you can see all kinds of information. And we just want to appreciate, we appreciate you tuning in today. 
Next week, we have Miranda Holmes. We're going to be talking about new home construction. So join us where the experts meet, and we discuss everything real estate from foreclosures to feng shui. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.